Hello, my name is Danae Doris and I am the project manager for the American Clearinghouse on Educational Facilities. I would like to thank you for joining us for a vodcast today entitled Multimodal School Transportation Planning. ASEF is the Educational Facilities Clearinghouse funded by the U.S. Department of Education, established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood schools, K-12 schools, and institutions of higher education. ASEF provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. We invite you to follow ASEF online at acefacilities.org and also encourage you to join the network of professionals already following the educational facilities discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and Blogger. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's vodcast, Mr. Todd Littman. Mr. Littman is dedicated to developing innovative solutions to transport problems. His research is used worldwide in transport planning and policy analysis. Mr. Littman has worked for diverse audiences, including government agencies, professional organizations, developers, and non-government organizations. He has worked in more than two dozen countries, and he is an author and frequent speaker at conferences and workshops. Again, it is my honor to present to you Mr. Todd Littman. Thank you for sharing your expertise with our audience today. Hello, this is Todd Littman for the American Clearinghouse for Educational Facilities, here to talk with you about multimodal school transportation planning, which refers to programs which help students, parents, and staff drive less and rely more on walking, bicycling, and public transit when traveling to schools. Walking and cycling are often called active modes. This can provide numerous benefits, including direct benefits to people who shift mode, and benefits to schools and local communities from reduced traffic problems. Research indicates that students who walk and bike to school tend to be healthier and better prepared to learn. Allowing children to walk and bike to school can help households save money and reduces parents' chauffeuring burdens. Reducing car travel reduces parking and traffic congestion problems and so can help schools and local governments save money and it also reduces air and noise pollution, making schools better neighbors and helping to create more livable communities. This is part of a larger shift in the way communities plan transportation. During most of the last century, automobile travel grew steadily, so it made sense to invest significant resources in building and expanding roads and parking facilities. Recently, automobile travel has started to peak while demand for alternatives is growing. This doesn't mean that everyone will give up driving altogether, but compared with their current travel patterns, many people would prefer to drive less and rely more on walking, bicycling, and public transit, provided that they are safe and convenient to use. In response, most communities are now doing more to support these modes. Improving school transportation options is part of community-wide efforts to create more efficient and equitable transportation systems. A half century ago, about half of all students traveled to school by active modes and only about 12% were driven by parents, but these percentages have reversed. Now, nearly half of all students are driven by parents and only about 13% walk and bike. Many factors contributed to these shifts, some of which are beyond school's control, Many communities have become more dispersed, an increased portion of students travel to specialized schools, roads have become wider and traffic faster, and concerns about student security have grown. However, schools and local communities can do a lot to support and encourage active transport. We now have good examples which demonstrate that an appropriate set of strategies can significantly increase active travel and reduce automobile trips to school. Of course, every student, school, and community is unique. There's no single recipe that applies everywhere. Multimodal school transportation planning requires understanding and addressing various barriers and providing suitable support and encouragement. School transportation management is usually a team effort involving students, parents, teachers, local officials, and other stakeholders. 
Fortunately, there are now excellent resources to help multimodal school transportation planning, such as the Safe Routes to Schools program, International Walk to School Day, and publications by professional organizations such as the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Let me describe how a typical multimodal school transportation management program develops. It usually begins with students, parents, teachers, school administrators, and local officials working together to develop a plan which identifies objectives, that is, what you want to accomplish, and targets, that is, specific things you want to achieve. For example, your objectives might include improving walking and cycling conditions, traffic safety programs, improved bicycle parking, and active transportation encouragement campaigns. Targets could include specific reductions in automobile trips and increases in walking and cycling travel. It's useful to survey students and parents to determine how they currently travel to and from school, whether they want to walk and bike to school more often, and the obstacles they perceive to using these modes. It's also useful to perform an audit or field survey of walking and cycling conditions on the routes to schools. You can organize students to perform the audits as a, as a class project, or you can work with local transportation professionals. Use a checklist such as this one, which rates routes for walkability. Similar checklists are available for evaluating cycling conditions. This information can be recorded on maps using colored markers, or if you work with local planners, it can be coded into their electronic mapping systems. This information can help parents and students identify the best routes for walking and cycling, identify barriers, and help communities prioritize walking and cycling improvements. Improving walking and cycling conditions usually involves improving sidewalks and crosswalks, bike paths and lanes, providing crossing guards, and implementing traffic speed controls on local streets. This is sometimes called complete streets planning. Make sure there is adequate bicycle parking at your school. It should be secure and located where all bicycles are visible from an office or classroom. Enough parking should be covered to accommodate students and staff who bicycle during wet weather. In some cases, schools can help parents organize walking and cycling school buses in which one or two parents accompany several children walking and cycling to and from school. Schools can also encourage parents who drive to carpool. Provide guidance to students concerning appropriate walking and cycling behavior and how to report any problems including traffic hazards and bullying that they see while walking and cycling. Special training can help students understand how to bicycle safely. Some schools incorporate bicycling skills training into their physical education or ec extracurricular activities. Many schools have encouragement campaigns and special events to promote active transportation, such as Walking Wednesday or participating in the annual International Walk to School Day. Special events such as these can encourage parents and students to try alternative modes, which may lead to more frequent use in the future. Let me describe one successful program, the Marin County Safe Routes to School program. It used a variety of activities to encourage active transportation and ride sharing to school. First, it identified various pedestrian and cycling improvements needed on local streets. Second, it sponsored monthly or weekly walk to school days and sponsored a frequent rider miles contest which rewarded students who came to school by walking, bicycling, carpooling, or bus. Parent vo volunteers at each school assisted in running the events and participated in strategic planning meetings to address obstacles that parents face when walking and cycling to school. It developed a curriculum guide that helps teachers incorporate walking and cycling safety into classroom learning activities, including discussions, presentations, and bicycle rodeos. Before the program started, more than 60% of students were driven to school. After two years, 
Walking and cycling had increased 57%, and the number of students chauffeured by parents declined by 29%. Multimodal transportation planning can also affect strategic decisions. As much as possible, schools should be located and designed to facilitate access by walking and cycling, for example, on lower volume streets toward the center of their catchment area, rather than on major roads at the urban fringe. To facilitate this, some school districts are changing school siting policies to allow smaller campuses that can fit into neighborhoods. The Institute of Transportation Engineers has special resources to help school districts implement more multimodal school policies and planning practices. Let me describe an example of a school that has evolved in design to improve multimodal accessibility. When the Moon Mountain Elementary School in Northwest Phoenix, Arizona was opened in 1970, it only had access on 19th Avenue, which at the time had only two lanes and low traffic volumes. But over the years, this was widened to six lanes and has nearly 40,000 daily vehicles. This made the school difficult to access by active modes and caused severe traffic and parking congestion at the school entrance, leading to frequent complaints from parents and neighbors. In 1999, the school campus was rebuilt so that the school buildings and the primary parent drop-off area were reoriented toward the interior of the neighborhood. The main access point is now on a local street that has traffic calming to control traffic speeds. As a result, traffic to school no longer conflicts with the 19th Avenue crosswalk, which has two crossing guards now who maintain a 15 mile an hour school zone. School buses load on another street separated from both the crosswalk and the drop-off area. The school has also implemented a parent pickup and drop-off plan and active transportation encouragement programs. Together, these strategies have virtually eliminated complaints about traffic problems. This is an important and timely issue. Many parents and students want to drive less and rely more on walking and cycling, but need support. School facility managers can help make this possible, which can benefit everyone. For more information, see the American Clearinghouse for Educational Facilities website, which provides links to more detailed information about multimodal school transportation planning. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to our vodcast today. We hope that you take this opportunity to learn from the content presented and add to your professional knowledge of multimodal school transportation planning. ASEP would like to extend a very special thank you to our presenter, Mr. Todd Littman, and to you for listening to our vodcast today. We hope you will join us again soon. Please remember to visit our website at www.acefacilities.org to access other learning events and follow us on your preferred social media outlet. Please take a moment to complete the evaluation. We value your input and your opinion and look forward to hearing your feedback.